years. Because Don and I have been married for 36, and we've been <laughs> collaborators for 35 of them. And Don is here in the audience, and uh, the love of my life and my research partner. You can't do better than that. So the story I'm going to tell you today truly is a story. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. There's going to be some science, because scientists, you can't help but put a little science in there. But if the science doesn't quite click with your understanding, it, it only is a backdrop to maybe a greater narrative of what we're going to be talking about today. So there's not going to be a test, even though what I'm going to talk about is going to involve organic chemistry by grants leaving, organic <laughs> chemistry, immunology, microbiology, and all sorts of ologies. They're only the backdrop for sort of a greater story. And one of the stars of the show is actually in the lower left-hand side. So a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about focuses on our, in essence, our own personal ground zero, the Berkeley Pit, which also happens to be ground zero for the largest EPA Superfund site in the United States. So Don and I were first married in 1980 and moved to Butte as part of our honeymoon. <laughs> and we worked at Montana Tech until 2009. And at that time, we were invited to move our research to the University of Montana, where they have a much greater biomedical um, emphasis than at Montana Tech. So we started all of the work I'm going to talk about here at Tech, and then it continued at the University of Montana. So basically, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the world's oldest profession. Now, for many of you who live in view, <laughs> you know what that is. But I'm going to suggest the world's oldest profession is actually drug discovery. Because before people were paying for sex or other things, people and our precursor hominids probably spent a lot of their time not only as hunter-gatherers, but also as individuals looking for plants, fungi, spider webs, whatever they could find in the natural world that might actually help deal with human diseases and animal diseases as well. As a matter of fact, we know that both chimpanzees and elephants both actually look in the natural world for plants that help them deal with diseases that affect them. So this search for health this search for health in the natural world is an ancient quest. Now, as scientists, we've made it a little bit more formalized. Some of that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, Don and I are what we would call natural products chemists. What natural products are, are those molecules that are produced by all sorts of plants and fungi, um, shark livers, bacteria, any kind of organism we accept larger mammals, produce a series of compounds that are somewhat specific to that organism. So some of our favorite natural products would include things like caffeine, which is a product of coffee plants and tea plants and cocoa plants. Um, nicotine, um, a major player in tobacco plants, and we know that both of these compounds, what we call alkaloids, are produced by these plants because they're both potent anti-feeding agents. They prevent insects from eating plants and killing them. So the next time you light up a cigarette and you start to do such a thing, remember, you are taking advantage of a very toxic compound that the plant produces to protect itself from predation. Now remember, these organisms don't care about us. A coffee plant did not wake up one day and decide to produce a compound that's going to make it easier for us to make it through the day. We just happen to look at those organisms and find uses for products that they produce that helps their own survival. These compounds are costly. It takes a lot of energy to produce these compounds. And so it is our job to find some of these compounds and see what we as humans can do with them. Uh, fungi are no slouches when it comes to natural products chemistry. And that's kind of where Don and I spend a lot of our time. Um, of course, this compound, pen 
penicillin was the first antibiotic used widely and is a product for, of penicillium chrysogenum. And so the quest for an antibiotic produced by penicillium is actually very near and dear to our hearts because in, in a sense it informs our own quest. Um, this is the Taxol plant. Taxol is the source of a very important anti-cancer agent called, now called Paclitaxel, um, but at the time it was called Taxol when we worked on it. It produces this compound um, from the inner bark, and Don and I were actually involved in that search as well. So all of these organisms produce interesting chemistry, and we go about looking for this chemistry in a very similar fashion. So I can literally pick any organism, um, including things like shark liver, sponges, any plant, dust mites under your <coughs> bed, you name it, Don and I can take it into the laboratory and find something interesting produced by it. Hmm. And we go about it in a very similar way. First, we select an organism. So it could be plant, fungus, sponge, bacteria. We extract that organism with organic solvents. Again, I told you we were organic chemists. So we're going to be using things like chloroform and methylene chloride, even alcohol. You could actually extract these compounds with gin and come up with interesting compounds. Now, if you think about some of the, the older cures people would have used in the 1800s, that's exactly what they would have done. They would take medicinal plants, soak them in a little vodka or gin, um, maybe whiskey if that's available, and then drink that as, as a tonic. And the medicinal value of the alcohol would actually be complemented by the medicinal value of the plant. Hmm. So anybody who's ever done that, you too are an organic <laughs> chemist. <laughs> um, whether you know it or not. Then this is a critical step. As we're going through this extraction process, it is absolutely critical to test those extracts for biological activity. There are thousands of compounds produced by every organism. And we can cater our search by catering the bioassays. And a bioassay is just a biological test. So we might be testing for antibiotic activity. Does the mint plant that's growing in your garden actually kill um, MRSAs. So MRSAs are a very important <coughs> class of bacterium that's causing more and more disease because they are not responding to known antibiotics. Maybe there's a mint plant growing in your backyard hmm. that produces an antibiotic that could kill those MRSAs. We can find out if we have the appropriate bioassay. We then separate the active compounds, again the chemistry, we need to get things in their pure state so we can actually figure out the nature of those compounds and test them. Um, again, test each column fraction. And ultimately, we actually come up with very pure compounds. Again, think about the antibiotic penicillin. Think about Taxol. Think about any drug that you might use. It's used in a pure form. And then we have to figure out what the structure is. And that can take a long time. But for Don and I, we actually began as marine natural products chemists. And for us, it was not just about going into an ecosystem and finding something that nobody else had ever found before. It was also entering into a relationship with that ecosystem. Because so many ecosystems are fragile and delicate. And people in our field were going down into areas in Bermuda and the Bahamas and the Philippines. And they were bringing backhoes and they were scraping the sponges out of these beautiful areas and completely decimating populations. They were tossing dynamite out into these ecosystems so that they could glean every last iota of sponge to do exactly what I'm talking about. And we found some really interesting compounds that way. But when people went back to that ecosystem to find more of that sponge, so that you could actually do something with this new compound. The reef had been destroyed, the sponge was gone, and it only grew in that one area. So Don and I actually started looking for a different way of interacting with that ecosystem. Instead of looking in the sponges, 
We look in the sponge for a bacteria that grew in the sponge. So we could take a tiny piece of material loaded with bacteria, bring it back into the lab, grow it in culture, and the reef never knew we were there. But the bacterium could keep us going for 100 years. You could literally walk Don and I in our laboratory with a little food, a little water, <laughs> and the microbes in our collection, and we could keep going looking for cures for a long time. So one of our first areas of research was Bermuda. It's a beautiful place. We found a bacterium within the sponge Darwinella rosacea, produces an amazing compound that actually was one of the most active compounds that was found against HIV, um, blocked the growth of HIV in human systems. Um, after that research, we moved a little closer to home and we started looking for a new source of a very important drug that was kind of hitting the news back in the early 90s. It was a compound called Taxol. It was produced by a specific new tree, a tree that grew an understory in many of the major sort of northern temperate rainforests. So if we think about the Olympic Peninsula, think about glaciers. These are what we would call northern temperate rainforests. And they often have magnificent fir trees, hemlock trees, dug fir trees. And in the understory is a beautiful little tree called the Pacific Yew Tree. And in the bark of that tree is a remarkable compound that was one of the most potent anti-cancer agents that had been discovered in the 1960s and 70s. It took about 40 years for that compound to be approved. And in the ensuing time, the Forest Service collaboration with the logging industry had actually collected new trees, piled them up, and burned them as trash. Mm -hmm. They had absolutely no commercial value. Mm -hmm. And so while we were logging the magnificent pineapple for fruit, all those new trees that could have been harvested for the production of trash bags were being burned as trash. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of an odd view of, of value sometimes. Now the fact is We're launching a huge endeavor trying to get enough new trees to produce plant health protection. So we have literally the right kind of population for health health So in 1990, a certain prescription for the National Cancer Institute, but this compound.
what we call the donor benefit. The tree doesn't help the result. It produces it by itself. The tree produces stem cells. The fungus produces stem cells. We came together in science and education. It's very exciting. And with an exciting research, Or in the future, do not show this off. Uh, you have to use the thing with that. Let's see. the box. the box first. Oh, So about that time, one of the things we were finding, we were partnering with folks from Montana State University. We had a patent on this beautiful little fungus and the production of Taxol. And unfortunately, one of our partners ended up being a much bigger name than we are and was able to, I guess I'll use the word, cheat us out of the discovery. So he blocked all of our funding from the National Institutes of Health. It was the first time politics truly reared its ugly head in our lives. So in about 1993, we found ourselves with one of the most wow. phenomenal discoveries in the scientific world that year. And we found ourselves with zero funding. And this gentleman had actually blackballed us at the National Institutes of Health. Um, he claimed we had stolen his research, but of course I had three years of notebooks to show that the reverse was true. But unfortunately, you're still without funding. So what are you going to do? Sue the best. Oh, I mean, you could sue the <laughs> You could sue the individual, or you could simply look for a new venue. And Don and I looked around after we sort of got over the disappointment of what we'd gone to, and we realized we had something very special in our own backyard, something that no other scientist in North America had, and that was the Berkeley. The Berkeley pit has become our very special ecosystem. Now, it's not an ecosystem that we have to worry about, that our efforts are going to damage it. It's a robust ecosystem. <laughs> we can defy anything we could do to actually hurt it. And, but it's in this very robustness that this ecosystem has been quite amazing to us. And as we find out more and more, I'll share this with you just a little bit. Uh -oh. Okay, maybe I won't be sure. Any idea why this isn't?